My name's Matt, welcome back to the shop. And today we're going to talk about... It's kind of like a shop... No, it is a shop chat. Let's get that fucking sorted out. It's a shop chat. Um, we're going to talk about just engineering engines and the compromise. This is a big thing. Uh, so, let's just talk about pistons. Oh, we've got a bit of red in there. Pistons rods and cranks and yes we'll talk about overlaps between the main journals and uh, crank pins as well that's coming up soon because we've got a really good example of a weird thing they had to do <laughs> but what we're going to talk about is cars cars everywhere hard hard plastic edges <laughs> oops <laughs> So talk about the compromise. So everyone seems to think that everyone like Yamaha, Suzuki, KTM, blah 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 blah, don't know what the fuck they're doing. It, you would not believe how many things are people like, oh you gotta change this, you gotta change this. You gotta change your bore to your stroke, stroke ratio, your rod ratio to your bore, and uh, we'll go through all of that. Got some good examples to show you the difference. But it is all a massive balancing act. And the engineers that design these engines know this and they produce loads of data and graphs and simulations and everything. And they try and pick, I've said this before about the perfect bore stroke ratio, it depends on your cylinder arrangement, it depends on your every, everything, it's all interlaced. And this is why when I hear stuff like, yeah, if you increase your, your rod length you are going to get low end torque and in, but lose, it's not that simple. It's not as simple as black and white. Why do people talk about um, bore to stroke? Why do people talk about that ratio? Why do people talk about bore to rod length ratios? Because people love ratios, they're easy to understand. They are black and white. You know, 2 to 1, fucking 4.8 to 1, stuff like that. They are easy and people love to assign that's more torque, that's lower torque, that's this, that's that not that simple. To give you an example of how much of a compromise this is and how much of a rabbit hole you start going down, let's just say we are going to keep this, so these are the constants, constants, let's just say we're going to keep our CC the same, alright? So what we want to do is we want to increase our piston ball, let's just make our piston just bigger. Right, let's just make our piston bigger like that. Why would you want to do that? Well, because of the force applied to the piston. The force inside that cylinder, when combustion occurs, the force applied to that cylinder. You can kind of think about your surface area in relation to your CC, so that's another one we can give a fucking ratio to. <laughs> um, but you can see that if you have a bigger piston, then more force is applied to it because it's the force divided by the surface area, right? Which means that for every square centimetre, the force is applied to that. Now, obviously, the force is being applied to your uh, cylinder, you know, your combustion chamber. Force has been applied to the bits of the cylinder that are exposed and the piston. If we can increase our bore, we're going to have to decrease our stroke. But if we can do that... Um, more of our volume, more of our total surface area, is piston. Great. Especially when we're at TDC, um, in relation to a smaller piston. So you think, well, you're collecting... It's like solar panels. You're collecting more sunlight. If you want more sunlight, you want more energy from the sun, the intensity of the sun isn't changing. You just have a bigger solar panel. You're going to get more. In a sense, similar thing with a piston. You're increasing the surface area. Now you might think it's force divided by that, so if the area is bigger then the force is smaller, but the force is constant because pressure is pushing on every single cylinder in the same way. The pressures should reach the same, because as long as your CC is the same, is constant, then the available energy that's in that fuel, because you're filling a volume and you measure out your amount of fuel and air via volume, so then our force should increase. So great, fucking why aren't we doing that? We've just got a big massive increase there. More power, let's all fucking go on. It's not the way it works. 
And you could literally come out with, and you can, a uh, area, so this area up here, area um, to CC ratio. You could do that, and you'd be like, great, we want more area. But it's not that simple. Just looking at this system, we've now got a heavier piston, right? So this is now 50 grams heavier, which means that all our forces go up when we're thrusting that piston up towards top dead centre on the exhaust stroke, where the high stresses are, the acceleration, all of that is related to our mass because it's our mass times it's our mass times acceleration equals a force. So we've got a bigger piston. Obviously, we've got a bigger piston. We're filling a, a bigger bore. We've reduced our stroke, but we're filling a bigger bore. Our piston is heavy, which means it has higher inertia. Oh shit! Here we go. It's not just the inertia. No, it's the inertia, momentum, stuff like that. So we'll break our con rod and crankshaft. So basically, what we've got to do is we've got to beef up our con rod. Oh fucking hell! Now we're getting even heavier. Right, and then the crank pin and everything's got to be a bit stiffer, so we've got to beef this up as well. Right, so we've got to beef this up, and that's per cylinder. You can see where we're going here, so yes, you might get more gains in one thing, but you're going to use up all the, that extra force that you can basically soak up. We're going to have to use that and distribute that around to all our components to withstand this, and all of a sudden we're back where we started. We're creating more power, but we're also losing more of it trying to accelerate. Or... It affects your RPM, which means it affects the work you can do, which it affects the power you can produce. It gets worse. Now we've got a bigger bore, which means we've got a bigger cylinder head, which means we can put bigger valves in it. And we put bigger valves in it because that's always good. But the thing is, when we put bigger valves in it, we're now increasing our port size and we're keeping our CC the same. The other thing as well is how that because we've got a short stroke, but because we've got a bigger bore, it's exactly how um, the volume increases because your um, relationship between your area of your valves, so your port area, if you want to put it that way, to the area of, uh, to the volume of how that volume increases with a larger piston, it's just it's just a mess and this is the problem is it's not just as simple and they would love to let you believe that the aftermarket wankers love doing that if you just change this you'll get more power you might get a bit more and then it comes back to how much more and you should always relate it to percentages they'll show you dyno graphs and stuff we go all fucking gooey eyed and our eyes dilate when we see more power how much more power oh 15 oh fucking hell 15 off power how much was it making? Oh, it's making 300. Well, that's fucking nothing. <laughs> fucking 5%. <laughs> that's nothing. It literally is nothing. It is an increase, obviously. But was it worth the two and a half grand that you had to spend for all your camshafts and all your lifters and all this, that and the other? All your rockers, shim, whatever you had to do. That three grand later and the dyno work you had to put into tune it to make the most of what you've just done. Now, if you are at the top end of racing, an extra 15 horsepower just off the bat would be absolutely fantastic, but those guys are already there. There'll be somebody in the comments saying, Matt, if you've got a fucking R1 and you increase it by 15 horsepower, that makes all the difference. Well, number one is, does it? <laughs> number two is... <laughs> Where is that horsepower increase? Because you're getting into the dynamics of everything. Your low end torque might not really have increased, but your top end does, or vice versa, blah, 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 blah. And the thing is, there's two ways you can really test this in reality. That's a drag strip, which is straight up acceleration, or it's a racetrack where you're trying to do laps where you're constantly speeding up, slowing down, speeding up, slowing down. And brakes could make just that much of a difference on your lap times. If you just change your engine, you're going to see a tiny difference. You're going to see a bit of a difference. But it's where it is in the rev range and stuff like that. It's not as simple as people try to. They try to put it in the box. They try to give you this kind of ratio and then say to you, that ratio equals this. But that ratio here, if you map everything out and work out your volumes and everything... Then you'll see exactly what it's doing, but it's just a ratio, and you can't have a blanket description of doing this will give you more power, doing this will increase your bottom end top, doing this will increase this. 
it might, but to what degree? They might be not lying, but three horsepower, fucking keep it for fucking 500 quid. You know, three horsepower, it's like, fucking come on. You get that in deviations in your dyno. You get that deviation if it's a cold day and you've warmed up your tyres. You know what I mean? Just because of air density, stuff like that. It's these things that make a difference. Air density, someone did ask me why does air density make such a difference? Like, you can feel it, it makes a difference. The reason why is you might think, well, if you look at the actual pressure, it's only gone up a tiny bit. Uh, not pressure density. If you look at density, it's only gone up a tiny bit. But you've got to remember, your engine's doing thousands of these power strokes. You know, 5,000 at 10,000 RPM. And that little difference multiplied by all that equals your power that you can make, and that makes a big difference. So you can make minute little changes. What I'm saying here is you might change one thing, but it changes the dynamics of a lot of other things. You can't just go around changing stuff. You, you can go around changing stuff, but there is not this, we've just changed one thing, and then we get a better result. If you could do that, and there was a point where engines were shit and they did do that, that happened a long time ago. So people asking for the best bore stroke ratio is because you've basically been sucked in by this idea that these ratio numbers are just going to give you an absolute answer. It's not that simple at all. If it was that simple, fucking some guy at McDonald's could easily just go, well, <laughs> if this ratio is better than this one, job done. Give me my 50 grand a year kind of thing. You know what I mean? It's not that simple and everything has a knock-on effect. You know, there's stuff like how your piston rocks around in your cylinders. There's just fucking everything. Everything makes a difference. And that's why when we see these GSXR thousands and stuff like that, we're in a bit of awe because it's like, my God, a fucking shitload of work went into that. It's just graphs after graphs after graphs after graphs. And I only say graphs because looking at data is boring. You know what I mean? So you might have, um, you might have, well, my power goes like this with increasing piston size. But with that, my flow velocities do this. And then with that, my inertia goes like this. And then with that, my fuel economy does this. And with that, you know what I mean? My volumetric efficiency has a peak here. And then with that, my whatever goes fucking like this. And when you look at all that together, you go, what's the best point? <laughs> well, it depends what you're after for one. Number two is it depends at what rev range. And so on and so on and so on. It depends on your gear ratios. Then then you start to get that's the after effect of the core engine and stuff. But if you add something that looks like this with oscillations of crankshafts and fucking all this, that, and the other, when you've got all this data and you plug it together and you manage to plug it together on the same axis, you go, ah, feck. Because with something like this, it might look like that that's the highest for a lot of the things. But then this might be a real big negative, because on that one, it's axis there, it could be fucking forces, and this could be like this. So it's not just looking for the peaks and stuff. In there, there's a point there, and there's a point there, and there's a point there, and there's a point there that are optimal. Depending on which one, which, you know, what you're looking at, there's all these points there. They are the sweet spots, and just by looking at all that rubbish you've got, I don't know where the fuck that is. That's because everything has a knock-on effect to everything else. And then comes the worst one. Yeah, it's all right, you say, that if we had... We've isolated all this, and we've got our piston to bore stroke. It's a graph like this, and we've got this, and we've got this. That's what we've got. They're the important ones, and we're going to go here, because that looks like the best. And you say, great. One problem, though, your intake length. To get these powers, your intake length has got to be... 3.6 meters. Oh, fuck. Where's the next one? Well, the next one's here. That's there. And that's 2.1 meters. Well, what about that one there? Oh, you say, well, we want our intake length there to be 0 0.5 meters. That's what we can get away with. We can bend it back on itself, put it through an airbox and all the rest of it. So we get our resonance right. Well, that looks like shit. So then basically what you do is you focus in on this, forget all that rubbish. So you get rid of all that, and then you have a graph like this, so that's basically this enlarged, and then you've got sweet spots in there, and you go, that one there, that's our sweet spot. And basically that's what you've kind of got to do. But one thing has a knock-on effect of the other. You just think, oh, if you just do all the maths and get all the perfect scenarios, you just pick the perfect scenario. 
then you find out you've got 3.6 meter length intake runners. At this specific RPM, RPM is the absolute knobhead. If you could keep RPM constant for all scenarios, fucking wonderful. And that's where CVTs kind of come in. The problem is, is the mechanic of CVTs, the mechanics of CVTs is that they usually are friction driven systems. And a lot of that is fixed by materials and how much load they can take. Again, with CVTs, you can make CVTs fucking take anything. If you make them big enough and heavy enough, the problem is, is making them big and heavy enough. So, you can see how difficult this is. And when I do videos, we're going to look at bore and stroke ratios, we're going to look at rod lengths, stuff like that. The conclusion will not be a yes and no answer. The conclusion will be something like this. And it'll be say, it'll be within this band. Within this band is a good region to be in based on point one, point two, and point three. However, there are cons to this, which is point one, point two, and point three. And that's the problem. Everyone's just like, well, why don't they just make everything fucking out of titanium? Everything out of carbon fiber and titanium? Well, because these materials are good in one respect, or usually one or two respects. In other avenues, in other conditions, they turn to shit. They're not the best material. And then there's that holy grail of everything which is cost. And in a sense, again, that is the problem. So, there you have it. You know, a quick breakdown of the compromise. And it is a horrible word, is compromise. Anyone who's married knows exactly what that word means. Very similar to marriage. It sounds like a good idea, this compromise thing, but really, it, the, the, the cards are stacked against you. It's not what you think it is. And one of the biggest things out of all this is packaging. It, all, it always comes back down to that as well. That's another bastard. You've come out with an engine. It's fucking awesome. Now you've got to fit it in. Oh, we can't do that. Oh, we can't do that. People are always saying to me, why did Yamaha make a fucking absolute boo-boo by putting the fucking oil pump there? I can't get to it. It's not easily accessed. Are these guys idiots? Are you kidding me? <laughs> that was the best option out of 17 different choices that would have been better for the engine or more power or more anything. Would have been better, but that would have made it completely inaccessible. You know, you get what I mean. And that is the problem is that they've got loads of chiefs in these design departments. There's the guy who wants to make it look sexy by covering it in carbon fibre. There's the guy who's worried about emissions. There's the guy who's worried about it passing the fucking noise testing. There's the guy who's worried about the cost. There's the guy who's worried about the most phys physically efficient way of doing it. There's the guy who's in manufacturing and says, we can't fucking make that. You know what I mean? And basically, all these people, they all cross over. And the fact that they can start a bike project and in five years have one that's mass-produced, that nearly all the yield is pretty fucking high is amazing it is amazing it is a feat of a feat of engineering but the feat is the people that are doing the work how they managed to get all their fucking chickens in a row to make all this work that is the feat that is the orchestra of the whole thing and sometimes they fuck it up you know sometimes they oh this breaks or they're gonna recall because this is fucked up a bit shit happens and we all make mistakes it's just that they've produced 50,000 of them so it's quite a big mistake but <laughs> But at the end of the day, it was a design choice and they had the pros and cons and someone made a decision. And sometimes it is not, and a lot of the time, it is not the engineering decision, it is the costing decision or something ridiculous exterior to that. Oh. I hope that makes sense. Robbing my lines now. Hope that makes sense and I'll see you in a bit.